Hi guys, here we are with Tiziana. Hi. And her channel. Her channel is Weekly Finance. So how are you, Tiziana? Um, I'm very good. Um, guys, thank you very much for having me. No problem. Nice to have you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tiziana, you come from, uh, you're originally born from Italy. Yes, from southern Italy in Naples, um, but I've been living in London for six years now. Okay. okay. So, why did you, what was the purpose of the, from Italy to England? Why did yeah, you... that's a very good question. Uh, basically, um, six years ago, that's when I moved, um, I just graduated and I felt like there were not that many um, opportunities in Naples in southern Italy in general. I wanted to work in finance and I knew that I had to move. Um, and I was thinking about coming to northern Italy, but at that point, if I had to be away from home, I thought, you know, I'll, um, I'll try and experience the, the London life. Uh, so my first job, sorry. No, uh, I didn't say nothing. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was saying that my first job was in university. So I was uh, basically like um, uh, the assistant of a professor. Okay. I'm, I'm sure you, you know. Um, and I was doing that for around a year. And then I started to apply a bit everywhere in the city uh, because I, I thought that I liked academia, but I, I didn't really want to do a PhD. I wanted to work in the city which was a bit the reason why I moved in the first place. Um, so searching here and there, um, I did something like um, 19 interviews in Dozo. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, so that gave me a lot of experience. And finally, I landed into an investment role, like an analyst investment role. Um, and that's what I've been doing since then for the past four or five years. Okay. But so where do you live by, sorry, if I can ask, where do you live by in, um, in England? Sure, so I'm in London, East London, um, it's called Poplar, so I'm just in front of Canary Wharf um, and around a 20 minute commute to the city, um, very close to Whitechapel, which is uh, the borough of uh, Jack the Ripper, if you're familiar, so uh, yeah. Very touristic, very historic. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so one thing that I, that I wanted to ask you is, what is the hiring process like in in the financial world? Do you do you just need to show that you have great marks, or do you need to? Is um, our previous jobs more important rather than marks in the universe? Well, that's the thing. In Italy, uh, grades are super important, but here people put a greater focus on what you can actually do. Um, if you have a previous work experience, great. Uh, but in general, people are more willing to give you a chance if they see that you are uh, quick enough, that you are uh, bright, that you want to work. Uh, that's what they want because they're going to hire you uh, to solve problems. So if you have the motivation and you're able to show that, and you can do that not just with uni, but also with extracurricular activities, you're going to find a job. That's a better, right? From my yeah. point of view, that's a better way of judging a person, not by uh, just, just grade. a grade, you know? Yeah, no, I, I totally it's agree. Um, it's much more like, tell me your story, tell me why you want this job and yeah. um, show me evidence in your life that supports Proof. your interests. Facts. Okay. Here it's all... Great. <laughs> yeah, if you have good grades, you get the job. If you have bad grades, you're stupid. That's basically it. As yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, eventually, just a matter of trying. The more you try, at the end, you're going to get something. Just yeah. capability. So the more you do it, the sooner you get it. So, uh, what, um, how did you start YouTube? Why, how did you get into YouTube? Why, why those kind of videos? Why the tutorials? I saw all the videos, by the way, by Bloomberg Terminal, the Excel videos, very nice stuff. Thank you. Um, so the idea I started because at work, they wanted me to do some tutorials for them. 
um, and um, and so that's how I started. I did that work. I uh, because they wanted to have some videos as reference when, for example, I was on holiday, um, or they had to train somebody new that was starting. And so I sort of got the hang of it, and I realized that I quite enjoyed uh, the process. Also, um, before um, starting as an analyst, I was teaching. So I already knew um, a little bit of just general uh, teaching oh, technique. Yeah. And, and I enjoyed uh, the process overall. And all the videos that I make, really, the purpose is um, to show uh, potential applicants uh, what they might face once they start working as an analyst. Uh, when I was looking for a job five years ago, uh, I did not have much um, insights into what an analyst would be or what working in the city meant. I knew that I wanted to buy a suit, that I wanted to wear it to work and wear high heels and um, just uh, talk to people about this complicated and interesting uh, stuff. But I didn't know what an analyst did, and if and, and so the purpose is just put out some content mm -hmm. that I wouldn't want to watch uh, back then. Very. So it started as a job, and then it went into a passion. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Very nice. Very nice. And did you did you have the terminals at your university? In yeah. Actually, we had one uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, stream. Yeah, uh, but when I moved to London, and mm -hmm. I was able to make use um, of the terminal and get my head around just the basic functions, but mostly I learned on the job, and that is good about Bloomberg. They are really supportive. They they have a big team of um, of analysts that will just come to your workplace and and teach you while you start. Okay, okay. Is the BMC a good start, or it, it's just um, fancy thing that is not really that cannot really be applied to everyday job to your everyday job? No, I find uh, I find it quite practical, quite um, applied. Uh, in terms of the knowledge, and I think it's a good asset to put on the CV, uh, just because going back to the to the previous point, when people are interviewing you, um, they need something that can do a job. That's what they're looking for. If you if you show that you have an understanding of the main function or just know how to operate the terminal without them having to um, to teach you, essentially, that's going to be a plus uh, for you. Okay, okay, okay. But is um, is the Thomson Reuters, uh, let's say, at, at the same level with the terminal, or is the terminal the the best? Of uh, well, actually, um, of I haven't used uh, Thomson Reuters that much. I was using it. Um, well, if I can just say my personal opinion, uh, which is not the truth, uh, obviously, I I think I got more use out of the terminal and um, out of Bloomberg, I mean, but maybe just because I've used it more. Okay, okay, okay. Um, another question that I wanted to ask you is that in university, we have, um, we study different things from accounting to maths and so on. So if you're good in maths, what is the best thing you can do after um university i know there are uh, quants that are very uh requested let's say uh from in in the financial world and is that uh are they are they well paid are the jobs good what 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 is that like well as a quant trader uh, for sure you you make a lot um like the biggest differential is at the beginning. You start with a with a higher salary, uh, but it's also a highly demanding job, um, and you need to be um, quite good at maths, obviously, to understand the the modeling. Um, but also, you you have to have the willingness to put up with long hours, with maybe night shifts if you have to trade on a different market that is not London. 
um, okay. if it's the Asian market, for example, or um, the US market. Um, but another thing that you can do if you like maths is maybe more applied econometrics um, and, and people that know econometrics can find a lot of different jobs in, in various industries within finance uh, okay. because it applies a bit to, to everywhere. Rather than quant trading, you could do quant research. Okay. So building uh, portfolio construction models mm -hmm. um, is one thing. Um, or econometrics for marketing um, is another thing that's really, really popular now. Uh, but in general, um, what, for example, as a general analyst, you don't use maths that much. Of course, it helps because you have to be um, quick with percentages. Okay. Uh, but what really helps is um, everything that you studied in uni that then uh, helps you understand the business model of a company so accounting a little bit but just business management yeah because one thing that is not clear is how good you have to be in mass in order to work in finance so i wanted to get a better understanding of that <laughs> well if you have if you want to be just an analyst in let's say an investment bank or in a an asset management um firm what is the threshold can you can you give us let's say a threshold in... well also when you say mathematics there's a lot of, of things that i'm thinking so if you're really good in algebra it's not really relevant for the job but if you if you're good in arithmetics so you you understand ratios uh quick then that is good because you look at a lot of ratios uh, because you have to um, analyze the performance of a company, so you gather some um, ratios here and there, and just you know, it's more about connecting the dots rather than ah, I'm really I I I did thirty on the um, dynamic optimization in my mathematics exam, um, and then all about differential equations. Uh, really, you never use that um, in an investment bank. Okay. I wanted to ask you something different. As a woman, mm -hmm. how was your experience in this field? I mean, here in Italy, in economics, uh, you hear a lot of men talking about economics, but how was your experience? Uh, yeah, no, it's a very good point, um, because I'm actually, where I work, I am the only woman in the investment team. Uh, often when I attend conferences, I don't see many women. Um, but uh, that's also like on us, in a way, uh, we maybe have to be more vocal about what we do, that it's not a bad environment and try to get more women to, to join because that makes the overall environment just better. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> so since I am um, talking about completely different things, since I um, edit the, the videos for the for the Hustle Hub channel, I was just curious to know how how do you find the idea to edit your videos, which software and how the how do you make the thumbnails? All those specific questions. Well, uh, it, it's super super basic. What I use, I'm sure you've you, you've heard of this tool. So I have a screen recording uh, software, which is called Screencastomatic. Yeah, it's a paid one, but it's around uh, fifteen dollars a year, something like that. Okay. So, um, um, I also have an, a software, a separate software for the editing. But in general, in my videos, I really do minimal editing, just for people to be able to follow. Uh, not fall asleep. Um, and then the, the thumbnails and stuff like that, I use Canva. Okay, oh. okay, 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 okay. But I really like the, the thumbnails. They're really, really nice. They want me to click on the video. Really? <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I really enjoy them. Now, I don't know personally much about Bloomberg Terminal and all this investing world, but it's you explain it even if I don't know all about this, you explain it in a way that is uh, very comprehensive. And you are cute too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so sweet. 
thank you. But actually, um, if you are the person that does the editing and stuff, you can give me some tips because <laughs> I really uh, could use Sorry some. Sorry for answering this. <laughs> <laughs> But I all I just I all thought I was self taught. I mean I didn't I all learned this all by myself, so I watched tutorials on YouTube. I mean I'm against uh, say courses because everything is free online. Yeah. So if you want to learn something just if you want to do it, you'll do it. You can find anything. Yeah, online just everything. So is is for us is easier because you're just one person. Here we divide our work. I edit, he does the script, and she's the voice. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I understood that. <laughs> for us, is we're hoping it's it's going to be a little more than a passion, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that that is the way to go. I mean, split the workload in three uh, definitely makes it easier to grow. Um, and I see that you publish a lot, so that, that's definitely the strategy, I mean. Yeah, we are trying to be as much consistent as we can be. Well, what do you think about environmental social governance? <laughs> I think it's ESG. Um, well, you know, I mean, it's... Um, it's such a trend now, uh, and I got more involved into that because uh, through work again it's something that they asked me to do um, and it was also an opportunity for me to become more of a portfolio manager uh, part of my part of my job is uh, managing a portfolio that I built from scratch and, it, and the main idea was to find all investments that could be thematic in some sort of way um, and I also see another big trend in the industry, which is avoiding active funds and going towards passive funds like ETFs, index funds, because they're very cheap. That means that in principle, I don't need to work in a way like I, I will be made redundant by this trend because we are active investors. The only exception would be ESG uh, because a human can select um, an ethical investment probably better than a machine that looks just at the numbers. Humans can see uh, a clearer picture of a company, um, not just uh, in terms of, I don't know, um, carbon dioxide um, offsets um, and other metrics like that, but in general, um, there, there needs to be some qualitative research uh, that analysts can do. So it's probably one way for us uh, to get better than machines over time and not be substituted. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to ask you is that Bloomberg has its own ESG uh, metrics. Are funds developing their own metrics to, to um, value ESG, uh, to see companies through a, a, an ESG perspective? Uh, yes, definitely. So it was first, I think it was MSCI that launched their own one. Um, then you have Sustainalytics, which is an independent one. But in general, all major institutional funds such as BlackRock, um, Fidelity, um, Standard Life, they, they would have developed some sort of model in-house because data is always incomplete. So you look at a consultant's research and you're going to see some gaps that you have to fill uh, internally. So there's why there's such a demand for analysts and there's, that's why you see a lot of ESG analysts here, ESG data analysts there. So talking about something different and uh, that's happening now, since you're in England, how was all the pandemic situation. How did you live the, the COVID life for the last year? Well, now um, probably much worse than you guys uh, because of the, the English variant from Kent that everybody is talking about. Yeah. Uh, because of that, uh, we have been in, um, in lockdown for more than a month. Um, I was also stuck here, like I was meant to fly back to Naples and then my flight got cancelled. Um, just like a day before. Oh. 
yeah, which was painful, but at least I was not one of those people that were already at the airport when they when their flight got cancelled. That okay. that would have been super infuriating, right? Um, but yeah, no, we we just have a lot a lot more time. Uh, work is usually busy in January, but I still found a way to work on the site or. Uh, my channel, try to think about content to put up there is a um, good use of time. So, yeah. We're just yeah, here waiting, everything is closed. There is it's a still in lockdown now. Yeah, yeah, it was a lockdown. So, gyms are closed. Um, you're not supposed to go to the office, you have to work from home. Um, shops are closed, just supermarkets are open, and pharmacies, the, the essential um, stores. But everything else is dead, and and you can't meet up with friends or anything. So we're just waiting. Um, it, it's very cold anyway, so it's not like we would go out <laughs> and do crazy things. But it would be nice to have some people over. I don't yeah. know, have a drink or something. Because you live, uh, if I can ask, you live on your own there. Um, yeah, I do. I I I live in my beautiful uh, London studio flat. Okay. At least your at least uh, your job is mainly smart working, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We we work from home, um, so everybody's uh, connected um, via VPN to their own machine into the office. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And do you have other hobbies? Mm, so before this all happened and like the, the apocalypse, I was uh, dancing a lot um, Cuban salsa. But as you can imagine, there isn't much Cuban sauce happening <laughs> in the world. Um, and yeah, I just enjoyed a lot uh, the learning because I, I started uh, five years ago. I started when I moved to London. I got to meet a lot of people. And I just liked that sometimes if you're bored, if you're alone, you can just go to um, you know the bar where, where the social dancing is organized. And you meet up with, with people and just uh, dance um, instead of I don't know going to the cinema alone <laughs> and going to yeah. eat alone or something like that. You like to be active, moving, doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we used to do things like this. We will again, I'm sure. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, I I wanted to ask you. One um, more technical thing. I <laughs> I saw the the other day an interview with Davide Serra, which is the founder of Algebris Investments, and yeah. he said that uh, what happened in the U.S. with GameStop could not happen in Europe because of uh, regulation. Is can do you have any better understanding? Uh, perspective on this or is it too technical for <laughs> um well i'm not sure what it means because uh, maybe the the thing that happened uh, in the us was possible because it's very easy for retail investors to set up an account and place huge orders um and you can get leverage as well but yeah. to get leverage you need to put the collateral which means you know that the demand for the stocks just goes up very fast. And probably uh, Europe, European market for this type of uh, trading apps is not as deep at the moment. There aren't many players uh, and a lot of people are yet to be educated. Uh, so having this kind of coordination, um, yeah, is probably less likely. Okay, okay, okay. And yeah, what, what do you think about uh, the Reddit situation that happened the other day, is it, is it something that is going to burst r really quick or um, hedge funds need to fear the retail investors, will need to fear more the retail investor in the future? Um, it, something like that could happen again, uh, definitely. I don't think that you can put in place some sort of regulation ex ante that uh, doesn't allow people to um, to just have a chat about what they think it's a valuable company and what is not because it's a free market after all 
Um, but um, I believe that in the long run, the strategy of retail investors coordinating is not very feasible. Um, so at the end of the day, hedge funds will um, j just have more uh, resources and more capacity in terms of losses that um, they're going to come out of this every single time. Um, some few individual in investors, some few retail investors uh, could make a jackpot out of one of these situations, uh, but it's not consistent um, and the majority loses. So. Yeah. But do you think they will uh, think twice before announcing a big short like they did? Well, the problem is that they are are a public in a way um, mm -hmm. the, the major ones they have to disclose their uh, their positions in their fact sheets when they when they publish them once a month um, so maybe they'll be more quiet about it but they have to disclose the positions okay 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 um, next I, I wanted to ask you during the Trump administration um, JP Morgan um invented uh, an index to uh, evaluate um the 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 influence that Trump tweets had on the stock market are they probably doing the same with reddit right now oh yeah could uh, they will be i haven't thought about it uh, but yeah um and I wonder if this is a trend is going to be long lived or is going to last more than the Trump administration. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's an interesting thought. And I wanted to ask you, um, have you have you ever tried other softwares rather than Bloomberg? You said uh, Thomson Reuters. I know Standard Standard Poor's has a few um, softwares have you ever tried them uh not with smp but i i know about morningstar so okay. morningstar has another huge database but it's not very used for single stocks and single uh, bonds is uh, widely used for mutual funds and for hedge funds it's a it's a big library uh, especially uh, you know i think that's their unique selling points really to give people like as I mean, the company I work for and our and our peers just a way to have all this information in in one place. And Bloomberg is really good for pricing for single stocks and for hedge funds and for mutual funds. Uh, but uh, other than pricing, their data is um, is not as precise sometimes. Um, and um, yeah, they they miss some information. So. Nowadays, uh, because I'm more doing research, uh, fundamental research, I'm using more Morningstar. But it, it's again, it's very intuitive. I, I would say more intuitive than the Bloomberg terminal, which looks a bit scary and a bit like something that came out of the 80s. <laughs> it can be a bit daunting, but Morningstar, much easier. Okay. So, talking about YouTube. When you started at the beginning, were you, say, where did you get the ideas from? Like, were you inspired by someone? Were there some channels that you liked that were doing this type of content? Um, well, I think I, I got inspired. I really liked the explaining technique of uh, Leila Garani. Uh, she, does, um, she does only Excel. Um, okay. She's a Microsoft MVP, um, most oh, wow. professional. Yeah, so I follow her on LinkedIn. I started to watch her videos and I thought, it's amazing. Like, this woman is talking about Excel and I want to watch her videos. <laughs> so it must have been like my, um, yeah, a reference point. Um, but in general, the idea for the content is all stuff that I've learned painfully sometimes at work because <laughs> nobody had time to explain to me okay. so okay maybe if i can make life easier for someone i put it out there well to be self-taught it's for me it's easier you understand stuff more rather than someone explaining and maybe that person doesn't even want to explain it to you because he's in a rush and yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so you still follow her now? Is her is her is she still the reference now? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Even though uh, I'm trying to branch out a little bit and, and trying to balance balance the tutorials with more of um, um, I want to say um, different type of insights that I can give to people starting out. So, for example, um, doing this series on um, technical interview questions. So. Uh, providing examples of what constitutes a good answer to an interview question. I would have benefited a lot from this kind of content when I was starting up. As I said, I did 19 interviews, so yeah. I I had a lot of questions and uh, it's another thing that you learn by doing. You... Yeah, experience. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to ask you something different, more personal. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? I mean, would you like to come back to Italy? Very good question. I I think that after London, like I, I'd like to leave London in a bit, maybe a couple of years or so. Um, and I'd, lo I'd love to move somewhere else in Europe, in Southern Europe, but I'm not ready to come home yet. I would like to experience another European country. I'm very fascinated by Spain. Um, Me too. <laughs> yeah, I I think it would be amazing um, to live in Canary Islands, for example. Oh, uh, I've been briefly, and it was uh, yeah, sensation. It was beautiful. Can you speak Spanish? Yeah, I uh, I learned it uh, without wanting to, in a way. Uh, because of uh, I, I started with Cuban salsa, and, and you know, for us, it's just so okay. easy. <laughs> we pick up the words at some point. I realized I can understand what this song is about, then <laughs> it's so cheesy. I don't, don't want to listen to this song anymore. Uh, and then I thought, okay, so I'll, I'll listen to podcasts and stuff. So, um, yeah, from there, it's really something that we can do. We don't have to apply that much effort. We just have to do it consistently. Uh, read a bit, listen a bit, and, and you get it. Yeah. One, one thing that I wanted to ask you is that um, uh, YouTube um, fin finance YouTubers talk um, a lot about investment books. Mm. Uh, are they a good start for a, a profession in finance or is it something that it's not necessary if you go to university? Yeah, uh, probably I would say more the second you said, they're not necessary. Uh, if you go to uni uh, and you study finance, then you know enough to get a job. I would recommend reading them if um, probably they're more useful to develop maybe a investor mentality okay. but not to be an analyst. To be an analyst, you don't need to read about Warren Buffett and uh, what's his um, way of investing or a uh, random walk on um, Wall Street, these kind of things. Um, maybe they, they might look well on a resume, but you won't be hired because you read those books. Yeah. Uh, you will be hired if you understand them, and I think university gives you a, a very good understanding of these kind of concepts. Um, okay. Yeah. And another thing that, that I thought is that recently um, communications by notorious CEOs and personalities have a lot of a big effect on the markets. Should they be regulated? I, I, for example, Elon Musk that talks about Bitcoin or Dogecoin. Yeah. Do you think uh, well, what do I think about this? I think that um, markets have become more efficient and a lot more people have access to some sort of trading account. So it feels a bit like it's inevitable, um, but in general, um, personalities, 
um, should be more aware of how they use social media, but not just them, I think everyone. Um, like in a way, you may think, oh yeah, these people should be made accountable as to the consequences. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if they're saying the truth and they have no second um, ends, then yeah. it's a bit difficult to discriminate. For sure, it sounds like a minefield for the, for the regulator to get involved. And, um, you know, unlike um, what happened with Trump and the Capitol, that was very clear what to do, right? Um, to suspend his account and everything, no one would argue otherwise, <laughs> she says. Um, but um, with the majority of things, it's not black or white, it's very tricky. Yeah, yeah. even uh, I think about pumps and dumps. The, if, you, if you have a, a big capital, you can move stocks, but it's not that different from many retail investors that make the same trade in the same at the same moment right yeah especially when the market is very liquid uh, it takes um a huge order to move the price something that you don't see anymore with uh, bitcoin for example okay 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 and um yeah one last thing that, that i thought is that if ESG capital grows bigger and bigger, will that um, affect the companies? Because if the companies look better from a, an ESG perspective, they'll receive more investments. Is that, will, will company um, try to do their best in order to look good from an ESG perspective? Well, that is the whole point um, of ESG in a way. So like starve of capital, the companies which are not sustainable, they're not the companies of the future, and instead try to reward um, um, those companies that you think are aligned in terms of their values uh, with what investors would want, especially millennial investors. Um, they, they, they want to have a portfolio that's sustainable, um, a portfolio that is responsible. And I think you're already starting to see the transformation. Um, even companies which are involved in um, sectors of um, highly polluting sectors, for example, they are spending a lot of money in the green bonds, in financing green bonds on the side or trying to um, invest in um, renewable infrastructure. Okay. Um, renewable ways of generating power just to themselves get out um, and accelerate the decarbonization. Um, and yeah, in general, almost every single company that's above two billion in market cap now has a ESG report. You know, okay. where they would say, this is how much we pay women, this is how much we pay men, um, this is how many women we have in the workforce and how many women we have in management uh, and this is the maternity leave and the paternity leave. Okay. Why do they do that? Because people with the money, because institutional investors are asking for these metrics to see how the social aspect is, how the governance is. Okay, and we talk about um, big asset managers like BlackRock, Fidelity and so on, but can small asset managers afford to set up their own ESG policy? What is the threshold to have your own ESG policy? Well, it depends. It's not, um, I don't think it's a question um, of um, capacity. I think okay. it's all about the willingness um, because to set up um, a ESG investment team, you need two people really. Um, okay. And you can start from there. And, and it's just a matter of um, resources that you want to allocate to that trend. And obviously, people didn't do it 10 years ago because clients didn't want it. But now clients are asking for it, and everybody all of a sudden has a ESG offering. But is are um, retail traders, retail investors, sorry, asking for ESG uh, investments or? Are they pension funds and so on? Uh, well, uh, at the start, it was the institutional investors, as you say. Um, but now more and more retail investors want it. 
And um, for example, here there's an app, it's called um, Trading to One Tool, but there's another, it's called Nutmeg. Um, and all these apps now, they have a complete side of the portfolio, which is ethical investments. And anyone literally with just a pound can start, um, can start doing them. And they also are categorized separately so that even people who uh, do not so much don't know so much about it, know that something is, uh, you know, is ESG rather than not. Okay, okay. And do um, companies that look good from a, an ESG perspective have, for, for example, uh, higher, higher multiples, like higher PE ratios, lower dividends, and so on? Yeah, this is such a uh, very interesting question that you're asking me. But, and, uh, you know, it's so true, like the um, valuation of this stuff is very choppy now, feels very stretched. Um, and it's, it is expensive. And uh, 2020 um, has been another year where green infrastructure has done so well, healthcare has done so well. Uh, tech has done so well. And, and so if you look at the performance yeah. of ESG funds, it, it's impressive. And people are starting to wonder whether, you know, um, this is actually the limit and they are going to re-rate at some point and maybe yeah. move a bit sideways, if not a crash. Uh, because nothing goes up in a straight line. Nothing goes up parabolically forever. Okay, okay. And because one of the questions that I thought is that do they perform that well just because a lot of ESG companies are technology companies? Because, for example, Facebook doesn't need to have a factory that pollutes like uh, a coal mine or something like that. Is it just because of technology or, let's say, um, green, ener green energy is outperforming uh, usual ways to produce energy or, or something like that? Well, as of today, there's a lot of new investments in those industries, the green energy. Uh, part of the performance is explained by the fact um, that ESG companies are not traditionally capital intensive, so they don't have that many assets to finance. Uh, but uh, not all tech companies uh, would fall into ESG. And actually, you mentioned Facebook, which is not considered ESG at all uh, because okay. of the privacy issues and um, all the scandal with the uh, Cambridge yeah, Analytica. From a governance, probably it's not that great. Yeah, uh, Yeah, the governance, exactly. Um, also, the, the social uh, metric is not that high because of um, involvement, so just bad press and stuff like mm -hmm. this. Amazon is another one. There's major concerns around um, its value chain, the way it treats its employees. Um, also, Google is another one, abuse of dominant position. The, there are concerns over the governance. Um, so, in general, I think that these companies are doing well because they are quality companies. So, uh, their governance is good. Um, there's no uh, dominant founder. Um, it is more democratic in its uh, decision making. Um, it has uh, quality of financials, quality of business model, um, quality of the product, and probably also its products which are essential. So in a way, um, there is the trend and the momentum, like they are in demand, but I think that also the underlying factors speak for themselves for being quite good at the moment. Okay. So since you you know a lot of stuff in this area. You know how a lot of um, YouTubers do the do their online courses of their niche. Would you ever think of doing one of your online courses, maybe on Bloomberg Terminal or Excel or? Um, yeah, that that would be great. Um, I'm th that is definitely the plan. It's just I don't have time. <laughs> My job is very demanding yeah. um, and also I feel like I haven't dedicated that much time to YouTube but um, and now I'm a bit all over the place with the topics and stuff. It's like I, I have to find my niche 
Okay. But definitely that would be the, the next step for me. I just need to have more discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But because on YouTube, like your your goal is it's not like getting more and more subscribers. I mean it's just giving it content that other people uh, can understand you, just like tutorials on these things. Like the goal is not to be famous and rich, let's say. It's yeah, no, exactly. Like I mean, you you have to be friends with the algorithm so that people find you. Exactly. That's but then you, once they come to this beautiful window that you put, if the store is empty, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, uh, so yeah, th this is things that I am. I put in the universe like uh, thoughts and, and things and plans, but I still have to translate that into a physical product. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're still in time. I shouldn't have asked this, but um, what age are you? 29. 29? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I thought 24. Yeah, 23, 24. Very sweet. Very sweet. <laughs> okay. Um, I just came across um, a post on Instagram, Bloomberg Business. It says, we're living in one of the biggest financial bubbles in US history. Do you see that in ratios? Well, yeah, but um, I mean, the problem is that there is no alternative for investors. They, um, okay. The rates are negative. Fixed income gives you 2% investment yeah. rate. That is below inflation. So if you don't buy equities, you lose money over time if you just yeah. win. Because it says, it says, why is it, why is this the biggest bubble? Because it, it encompasses not just stocks, but pretty much every other financial asset too. And for that, you may, you may thank for the Federal Reserve. That's what Bloomberg says. <laughs> that was Bloomberg said. Uh, yeah, because the the Federal Reserve buys the assets to to put liquidity. Uh, well, <laughs> what is the the alternative again? Is yeah. to uh, let the whole thing collapse? Um, yeah. I don't know. Like I am. Uh, it's a bit difficult to think. What what would you do? Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, but people just like to put these big titles out there. It's very easy to trend when you say stuff yeah. like that. So. Understandable. And you work in asset management. Uh, have you ever thought about um, moving into other um, subsectors of finance, let's say private equity or, I don't know, investment banking? And if you if you know about people that work in, in these other areas, what are the differences between asset management, investment banking, private equity, I don't know, consulting and so on? Yeah, uh, so consulting is my least favorite career. Um, I have a lot of friends that, that do that. And I think it's an amazing way to start uh, because there's a lot of demand. It's quite easy to get in and you are exposed to a lot of different projects. Uh, but but long term, it's very difficult to specialize into something if you change every six months. Like uh, just when you're starting to, to learn, um, you get transferred to something else. So it's a bit dispersive in my opinion. Um, and uh, the other um, investment banking, um, as an analyst on the sell side, your job is a lot more accounting than what I would do, which is more investment. Yeah. What I like about what I do is the portfolio construction, is how you can choose 20 different things, and every different thing will do a bit of this, a bit of that, but overall you make a nice product that gives you 7% a year, uh, you know, that does better than the market when times are difficult, that tries to do, sometimes does a bit better when the market does well. But I think this is fascinating. Um, for me, just being on the buy side, you get to pick the interesting yeah. stuff, you get to choose what you want to focus on, what research you want to do. Um, instead, on, on the sales side, it's all about the multiples, it's all about the ratios. Um, and I don't know, just um, to me, it feels too much into the technicalities of a single company and you lose focus of the bigger picture. So, okay. um, 
it depends on what you like. Accounting was never my favorite thing. Okay. Uh, and I liked investment more. And, I mean, people think differently. So. Okay, it's okay. Also more demanding investment banking. You do long hours. Sometimes there's peer pressure to work during yeah. the weekends and stuff, uh, which is not ideal. Um, instead, because we manage portfolios for the medium long term, um, unless there is something <coughs> early, we, we finish at 5.30. Okay. 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 Um, sometimes because... I do have to work until seven if there's some clients mm -hmm. that was something, or if there's a research project that's urgent. But overall, I think it gives a nice um, balance, work-life balance, okay. uh, and it's never boring. It's really it changes a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Asset management is more Bloomberg Terminal and investment banking is more Excel and PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but actually it's also uh, Blo um, Bloomberg a lot because before the data is in Excel, is in Bloomberg. They just yeah. extract it, they play with it, they put it in a presentation. Um, okay. We also do that um, in a way, um, but um, I still think that our research is more varied and, mm -hmm. and is less quantitative, less fundamental, and more big picture business models. Okay, okay. So now that you're in lockdown and we don't know when you're going to be out of the lockdown, which is the first thing, the first, first thing you want to do, you're going to do? Well, what are you missing the most? Alpha. <laughs> yeah, I think dancing is one thing, but uh, realistically, dancing will not be the first thing to open up. You know, it's not like a first day out of lockdown party. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to organize a salsa party where I live because there's a um, terrace. Uh, in, um, in this building, there's a um, rooftop terrace. Wow. Yeah, I would really like to invite people. Uh, if you look, one of my thumbnails is me looking at Canary Wharf from, from the terrace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would like to do that. Or just meeting friends. Um, not necessarily go to the pub, because I, I really don't. I had enough of the pub here. Uh, but just have them here and host, um, yeah, a dinner. Some company, just some. Um... Yeah, see people. Yeah. Simple stuff, Actually, you know, yeah. guys, thank you very much for talking to me for an hour. Because <laughs> I am. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry now for you. We can do, we can do this every day if you want. <laughs> <laughs> On YouTube, do you get asked a lot uh, doing these interviews, or is this your first time? And um, the interviews is the first time, but I do get a lot of emails of people. Uh, asking me to help them with with their data research projects, <laughs> um, and I I do try to to help um, as I can. I I do get to do some interesting stuff, uh, which is the point. Okay, and I wanted to ask you, um, what um what is different between asset management and private equity? You're both on the buy side, but you. Yeah buy into different things i know private equity looks at private companies but what what is the what are the difference what is the difference in the day-to-day -day job yeah um okay so for example uh, i work for a private company so when we say private equity in general is everything that is not listed but private equity as a private equity fund uh, the difference is that for us, private equity is one of the asset classes we could invest in. So we could, instead of buying a REIT, instead of buying a listed fund, we could go to um, to a private fund and say, look, we, we plan to pledge this capital, invest it in, I don't know, it could be um, infrastructure projects or it could be real estate or it could be a new piece of software, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we we would consider private equity as one of the possible investments that we can do. 
Instead, if you work for a private equity fund, then you specialize into finding uh, startups or um, uh, in general companies that are in the ramp up and need capital for that. And you specialize a lot into predicting the cash flows that will be associated with this new product, which involves a lot of forecasting and a lot of knowledge of the markets and a lot of accounting and a lot of Excel. Um, and you basically build this uh, discounted cash flow models, which spans multiple spreadsheets. And you have your different uh, multiples, but you also have your, um, how you say, your assumptions. So you, because you're going to use a lot of assumptions, for example, this company is going to grow 5% every year uh, for the next five years, then it's going to grow 1% forever. And then the way you build the spreadsheet, you're able to change these assumptions and everything else changes. So um, I would say they become experts, these analysts, they become experts into financial modeling. Instead, Financial modeling, I look at some DCFs, discounted cash flow models, but it's not what I do day to day, every day, luckily. Okay, okay. And I've seen a few videos um, of people that were in investment banking that said that a lot of people wanted to move into private equity. Do you see the same thing from an asset management perspective? A little bit, yes. Um, why? Uh, because private equity is more exciting when you find you know, that particular company that blows up and you get to have a very nice bonus from time to time. Um, but that is more um, a job that works um, on specific projects. So also that you can have your workload at some point during the year that just goes insane. Mm -hmm. um, uh, instead, um, something like that where I work doesn't happen so much. So it's more a stable workload. Okay, okay. And I, I, I have a few ideas, but why did private equity grow that much in the last few years? Uh, well, it's because uh, banks uh, since 08 stopped lending. Um, so private capital had to step in. Um, if you are a startup, you will not secure funding uh, from a bank. Um, yeah. You will not get that capital from investors. So really the, the option is to find private investors that will, um, that will give you the capital initially. Okay. And one, another thing is that um, sovereign funds kicked in, let's say, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, then uh, Emirates um, invested a lot of money in, in private equity, right? Uh, um, another thing, do you, do you know SoftBank, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think about raising a, such a big fund for venture capital? It, it's, it's not looking that great. Um, what do I think about raising so much money for venture capital? Um, yeah, it's I don't have... Allocate. It's quite hard to allocate that much money, right? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't read so much about the situation, so I don't... Yeah. I don't yeah, know. they invested in WeWork and it didn't work out that well and... Okay, okay. Um, yeah, but that was another thing. Um, so, I mean, with the WeWork situation, um, there was this big hype, right? Uh, but instead, people forgot that it was real estate. So, mm -hmm. when he actually believed it's real estate, people were all freaked out. <laughs> how, how is this not doing so well? Because it's property, especially offices, they depreciate so quickly, they require a lot of maintenance. And it's just down to the expectations that people have. Um, and um, especially, obviously, no one could have predicted what happened uh, last year. Uh, but that was just uh, another test that some things are naturally going to be correlated with, um, with the economic cycle. OK, OK, OK. So just to wrap it up. 
something that you miss about Italy? Oh, guys, like if you move to London, you're gonna know. <laughs> like after a week. Um, so it's the food um, mostly, really, because I really love to eat. Like I, I think everyone. Like there are a few people that don't eat, <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, uh, how how do you enjoy life if you don't eat? Um, here you have to spend quite a bit of money if you want to eat decently. Which in is England. Yeah, in England. Instead, um, it enables you, you fix yourself a dinner with whatever you, you get in the salomeria or whatever. And, and instead here, they don't have these sort of things. Uh, yeah. They're just mm -hmm. a supermarket, which can be awful or uh, just bad, <laughs> you know, just yeah. average. <laughs> uh, the other thing is the weather. I mean, yeah. um, I was not this pale when I moved, I, I swear. Like, I looked more human uh, instead after six years. Like, um, you know, you, you may get vitamin D deficiencies. Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the last thing, you probably will want to get this one out, but you also have to get used to not having everything in the toilet that you would want to have. <laughs> there is oh, one. I uh, uh, <laughs> so, you know, that now I actually go, you get used to the shower. Don't ask me how uh, <laughs> but it happens after enough years that you spend abroad, then you don't miss it anymore. Yeah. I never thought I would say that. But the bidet, okay, so food uh, and weather be the Maybe. bidet situation. And something that's maybe it's in England that could be in Italy. What you like most of England, maybe? Yeah, uh, I I love that people are very professional at work, and no one is ever gonna put you into an uncomfortable position with um with a comment they should make, or people are generally not nosy and these kind of things. Uh, so there's very much respect for uh, for people, respect for their privacy, these sort of things. Um, and in general, I I found that um, here the local council works a lot better than <laughs> Naples. Uh, just getting your driving license renewed and all these kind of bureaucratic things is super easy. I'm oh. now in the process of getting the passport, and it's not been difficult at all, the whole thing. Not but here, not here. Bureaucracy is a, is a problem over here. It is. <laughs> and it's like, here you have to pay, like, for the passport, I think in total, I would have spent 1,500 pounds, so it's not a joke. But at least you get it. I mean, at least mm. the, the process works. Yeah, okay. at least you don't have to wait a year, two years for for the document <laughs> or the driving license or whatever it is. Yeah. Here, you have to wait so much time. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are the only things that, if I could, I would import and yeah. and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The last thing that I want to ask you is that um, is did are are foreigners looked in a different way after Brexit? Do you um, feel well, the thing is, I live in London, and I'm so exposed to a different mentality. In London, as you know, everybody voted to stay in the European Union. Okay. So um, my my answer would be no. Um, actually, people are pretty pissed. They, they wish they stayed. Uh, but if I lived in Leicester, for example, in the Midlands, uh, I would give a very different answer. They they really have this perception that they are full, that there is no place for more people. Um, so, yeah, they, they didn't like us before, and <laughs> they for sure don't like us now. Okay. Uh, but in London, it's, it's fine. Okay, okay. I uh, thank you for having us. It's, it's been a pleasure um... to you. And to you guys, thank you so much. So nice to meet you, very interesting person. Now, like, I hope to see you maybe in Italy. We can. Uh, yeah, come. I would love that. <laughs> I never seen Naples. Me neither. So we can yeah. we can dance some salsa over there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Okay. Now, like, like AMC says, it's time for the 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 lunch. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch because um, it, I know it's much better than what I'm gonna have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being with us. And Great. ciao. Ciao. <laughs> ciao. ciao. ciao.